Good afternoon, attendees. Thank you for joining us for today's USDA, ARS, and WSSA web series. Today, Melissa Smith will be discussing uh, weed science and research. We're gonna give a minute or two for the room to fill up um, and I'll be back in a second. Good afternoon, everyone. We're just waiting for the webinar room to fill up before we start our discussion on weed science and research. Please give us a minute or two for attendees to fill the room. Dr. Culpepper, we're about two minutes after the hour, if you'd like to get us started. Thank you so much, Eric. Hello once again, everyone. Thank you for joining the third presentation hosted by the Wheat Science Society of America and the USDA Agricultural Research Services. My name is Stanley Culpepper. I am the current president of the Wheat Science Society of America. It is my privilege to welcome you and to introduce Dr. Steve Young as the moderator. Steve is a weed scientist and the national program leader for weeds and invasive pests at ARS. Prior to his current position, he was a faculty member at the University of Nebraska, Cornell University, and most recently, Utah State University. Steve, take it away. Thank you, Stanley, and welcome everyone to this webinar series. As you've heard, this is the third webinar uh, for the series, and uh, we're focusing on weed science, invasive plants. So uh, today we're gonna be hearing something in the theme of tactics. So we've had um, the theme that's been going since last week, we talked about integrated weed management and cropping systems. And today we're gonna move to non-crop systems and we're gonna hear about the advancements in weed biocontrol tools. And so, we're going to hear from uh, Dr. Melissa Smith, who is a um, research ecologist at the Invasive Plant Research Laboratory in Fort Lauderdale, Florida, where she began as a postdoc in 2012. Uh, Dr. Smith grew up on a sheep farm in Western Oregon amongst the Douglas fir, where her love for the natural world was instilled by her family who insisted on camping vacations. I can uh, relate to that one. Uh, later, Dr. Smith attended Willamette University, where she had, uh, earned a Bachelor of Arts in Biology in 2003, while supported by a vocal music scholarship. While an undergrad, Dr. Smith attended the Organization for Tropical Studies, Tropical Ecology Semester Abroad, and this is when she realized that the, being an ecologist was a viable career choice. So before committing to a graduate program, Dr. Smith joined the National Park Service, as an education and interpretation ranger working for Kenai Fjords National Park, Glacier National Park, and Everglades National Park. I love those national parks too, those are great. So um, anyway, during this time, Dr. Smith observed how invasive species impact spaces and landscapes that are ecologically critical and in intrinsically valuable. So during her PhD studies at Washington State University, Dr. Smith worked with Dr. Richard Mack, to develop testing protocols to determine invasiveness in plants from a suite of physiological responses. At the Invasive Plant Research Laboratory, Dr. Smith has delved into many collaborative projects to investigate larger ecological questions such as competition, predation, parasitism, succession, and I'm sure many more, but within a weed biological control context. Most recently, Dr. Smith was awarded an ARS area-wide project to develop and refine IPM for water hyacinth. 
the world's most invasive weed, but also to elucidate the larger ecological consequences of IPM measures within the community. So with that, Dr. Smith, I'll turn the floor over to you and let's hear more about it. Thanks so much, Steve, and thank you, Stanley, and thank you, uh, WSSA and ARS for continuing the symposium. I'll echo Marty's uh, sentiment that I'm sad we're not in person and in Vancouver since I'm from the Pacific Northwest, but uh, this is a very close second, so thanks so much for having it. Um, let me go ahead and start sharing my screen. All right, can that be seen? Yes, looks great. Okay, super. Uh, so like Steve said, we're going to move into natural systems and Marty Williams did a very nice job of focusing on the agricultural systems and different tools that are used to control weeds there. And it's really great working for an organization that provides resources, research and energy and emphasis into looking at both because they are both critically important for national infrastructure, but also you know, human well-being and, um, and ecosystem services. So uh, just like Marty, I'll, uh, I'll tell you my biases right up front, which is that I'm a community ecologist and I have a strong ecophysiological background. Uh, and so that perspective is probably going to come out in this um, talk. I also like to start my talks with a basic understanding of what invasive weeds and invasive plants are and to have that very clearly defined before we get started. I know that this is probably a broader weed audience, but just so we're all very clear, um, I use the Mac at all 2000. Uh, that's probably because uh, he was my boss for forever. So it got beat into me. Just kidding. Um, but that uh, definition is that the spe it's a species that uh, establish in a new range and they proliferate spread and persist to the detriment of the environment and that detriment or harm is the critical point for how we define invasive species. It's also important to know that these are human mediated invasions, uh, so humans are intrinsically part of the process of invasion. And within non-agricultural systems, we really focus on their impact on ecosystem services. And certainly there are economic impacts and those are usually incurred by uh, having to control large scale invasions, but certainly the economics tied to ecosystem services are hard to pin down, but they're no less both economically and ecologically important. These include community resilience after post-disturbance, which is increasingly important as we enter into a new era where climate and weather are not predictable. Resources such as hydrology and water filtration can be impacted by large scale invasive weeds. Soil building and soil development can be in, uh, drastically impacted by them, particularly when you have grasses in an otherwise grassless ecosystem, you get large scale shifts in carbon and nitrogen ratios. Pollination sources, nectar sources, host range sources can be reduced for native pollinators and that can impact crops and other important uh, plants on the ecosystem. And then if we start moving into things that uh, affect directly affect humans and the communities we interact with, those can be a loss or alteration of goods, including fish. So for example, water hyacinth reduces fish populations underneath them because of a decrease in dissolved oxygen. Or we can lose forest products because they've been displaced by things like Japanese barberry or we get increases in questing sites for pathogen vectors like nymphal ticks in those same systems. And finally, and this is, it comes back to where I got my start, which is that we have a reduction in recreation enjoyment and also culturally important plants that are important to people that visit places, but also important to the indigenous communities that are from these areas. So, they are not necessarily tangible, but we work in the intangible and tangible here in the non-crop systems. Oops. So species become invasive through a couple of different hypothesized pathways. 
A few are based in what I like to call an evolutionary pathway. One is that they might be able to exploit disturbances. Let's say that they are um, either K selected or J selected. And depending on that, they're able to, uh, to exploit highly disturbed areas like roadsides or, or community edges. That can be one way a species gets its foothold as an invasive. I worked frequently in graduate school on this empty niche hypothesis in which a community is inherently invasible. Uh, so for example, you may have two forests that are physiognomically similar. They have many of the same constituents, the same congeners, same structure. But in one, you have, let's say, uh, rhizomatous grass in the understory. And in the other, very similar community and habitat type, you don't have that. that niche is therefore empty and may be able to be exploited by a taxa that could fill that. And then finally, this last one is sort of an interesting one, and we won't get into it, but that's the evolved invasive competitive ability hypothesis, which is that as a population comes over and individuals from disparate populations interact, they may go through a bottleneck and alley effects and come out the other side with uh, evolved increased competitive ability. So those are the sort of theoretical sides of things. And what we're really going to focus on today, though, is the circumstance based, which is that when a species comes from a place and is introduced into a new habitat that is otherwise uh, uh, ecologically similar and conducive, it is then released from its natural enemies. So it's released from the competitors, pathogens, parasites, and predators that otherwise keep it in check in its native community. So what does this look like? I like a little cartoon. We're going to use Melaleuca as a, as a example here. So with no top-down control in a new environment, a species seeds, doesn't have any controls on the seeds or seedlings. They grow unabated until you get a monoculture of this. And we can all think of examples of where this is the case. So when top-down control is reintroduced through classical biological control, we get fewer flowers, which result in fewer seeds. Those seeds that do germinate are attacked heavily as they grow. And as that happens, the competitive interaction between that invasive plant species and the community constituents that were there before begins to shift and you get a recovery of the native community, wherein the species uh, that is the target for the biological control is still there and still present. Biological control is not biological eradication, but it shifts the competitive interaction enough so that the native community has a chance to regain a foothold and have some level of restoration of function. This can also be thought of in terms of a co-species uh, uh, interaction, for example, like the Lotka Volterra curve. This is highly oversimplified and definitely not the case, but I just kind of wanted to give people who are different types of learners a different example to look at. So in this case, prey would be your target weed, predator would be your uh, biological control agent. And what we're trying to do with biological control is potentially shift uh, what would be a an, basically an asymptotic line where the target weed has already hit a maximum so that it starts oscillating up and down. And with biological control, we just simply want to shift that lower. So again, that those populations decrease, they're always going to be there and still cycle unless we have other methods that, that are employed to get rid of it. But we want to reduce that level of, of interaction, or excuse me, of um, population growth so that we get recovery in those times when the populations are particularly low. So let's focus now on the current status of biological control and classical weed biological control. So over 500 agents, and those include insects, mites, and even fungi in some cases, have been released on um, over 100 weed targets in 90 countries. About 172 of those 500 agents have established and are causing some level of effective control. And effective is simply a measure of 
has it reduced something, some level of like seeding biomass? Are we seeing an impact of that? So uh, fairly high, although we can talk about and we'll discuss ways that we can improve both of these statistics. And in certain instances, we can see an incredibly high return on investment, much higher, in fact, than, say, other methods that we might employ, like chemical methods. So um, this is ongoing, and I hope to argue effectively that it's something that should be employed in any large-scale weed management strategy. My talk's going to be organized into three different sections and they basically uh, correspond to the three different phases of biological control research. The first phase is the feasibility where we try and figure out if this is something that is financially and ecologically feasible to do on a new target weed. Uh, and then we head over to the native range and survey for those weeds. So that's gonna be what's pictured here on the left hand side, which is me surveying in Australia. We're then going to go into quarantine and talk about advancements and tools for quarantine and how to more effectively use our time within that to produce successful biological control agents. And over here on the right hand side, we're going to talk about post release uh, survey impact studies and then community interactions. The first tool that we really started to uh, introduce into biological control was integrating molecular tools into our, into our methods at several states of, of the study. So uh, I'm gonna use the example of old world climbing fern here, which is an invasive fern that ranges throughout Southeast Asia, Australia, and even parts of Eastern Africa. It's invasive throughout Southern Florida. There's a congener, uh, Ligodium japonicum, which gets into North Florida and Georgia and Alabama. You can see that it climbs up into the canopy. It alters fire regimes. Uh, it alters hydrology. It's windborne and self fertilizing, uh, has self-fertilizing spores. So it has the potential to take over very large parts of the Everglades, which is America's largest wetlands. So again, important intrinsically and also uh, dynamically to the populations here in South Florida. So with Ligodium, we employed, uh, so this is just with uh, uh, cytochrome oxidase one, which is just one marker on this on the uh, chloroplast system, which is fairly simple, um, and we'll get into other molecular analyses. But we were able to see that one Ligodium microfilum and Ligodium japonicum are fairly distantly related within that system, and two that Ligodium palmatum, which is a native North American congener, is sister to pretty much the rest of the group, which is both Old World and New World ferns. What this does is twofold. Many of the species that we work with their evolutionary relationships within the genus and family have not been well elucidated. So that's a th one thing we need to look at when we're looking at especially our centrifugal tests. The other thing where this is really quite helpful is figuring out which of the populations we need to go to to look for agents. We always want to go to the original source population and frequently the notes, especially if these were uh, accidental introductions, but even when they're intentional introductions, we frequently lose notes to history to poor record keeping all of that. The DNA doesn't lie. So this has been a very helpful tool for figuring out where to start looking and which species to incorporate into our testing system. What is that testing system? So all of the modern, let's say the last since the 1950s, um, but especially since the 1970s outward, uh, safety testing and host range testing that's done within uh, biosafety level two quarantine facilities has been based on this Wapshire test, which is basically that we go in a centrifugal method with starting with the closest native relatives first, and then working our way outward to species that are not necessarily related at all, but might be uh, federally threatened or endangered or are of some concern otherwise. Uh, we've even started to move into things that are a 
a host plant for a congeneric insect. So uh, if anything, this uh, this has actually expanded the list of species we need to test while, while in quarantine and, and lengthen the amount of time that insects are in quarantine. But again, what this has done over the last 50 years is produce incredibly safe insects. Our, our rate of direct non-target host use is incredibly low, less than one species. So, um, and that's all produced by these choice tests. So looking at the fundamental host range, which is an incredibly conservative uh, filter. Uh, but in the case where we need to use choice tests or multi-generational tests, we then have a very clear picture of the evolutionary relationships that are probably going to produce uh, the most likely uh, non-target hosts. So that's quite important. Um, and then again, just to reiterate, uh, we there's very little tolerance for non-target host use. So a species, in order to come out of a quarantine facility and to get the permit to come out of a quarantine facility and be used as biological control has to pass this threshold where it cannot subsist any type of population growth or subsistence on a non-target species. So that's why we've been able to have a, a pretty safe track record there for the last several years. So expanding that, um, that genetic and molecular tool set has been the advent of uh, next um, next gen sequencing and whole genome sequencing. And this became particularly important with this particular example. We'll stay with the old world climbing for an example. So we have an areified mite that was approved for release in the late 2000s, and it causes these uh, leaf galls, so galls around the margins of the leaflets, but also some pretty spectacular galling on the apical meristem, which when uh, done heavily can really cause a, a pretty significant impact. However, when we look on the landscape, this species only attacks about 50% of the Ligodium that's here in Florida. So we tested chloroplast genomes, we collected galled and ungalled materials and tried to compare them uh, using microsatellites a couple of years ago and didn't find any significant differences. There was no difference between what the mites were detecting as gullible and what we were detecting as gullible and the non-gullible species. Well, we collected this mite from what we thought was the source population here in far northern Queensland, where the X is. But next genome sequencing and whole genome sequencing that was done within the last year, actually the last six months, revealed that this was in fact not the source population for our Ligodium in South Florida. In fact, it looks like it was more likely from Singapore or even Malaysia and Thailand, where the species, where Ligodium is, is pretty common. So next genome sequencing changed the paradigm for Ligodium and is as soon as travel restrictions are lifted, we're heading back in there to try and collect this mite again. It's the most common herbivore on this species and it will, uh, it will hopefully give us a bit more success in Florida for the species so that we'll get better coverage. So really good utilization of this molecular tool. If we shift our thought a little bit more though from molecular tools to maybe plant chemistry, the situation looks a little different. Generally speaking, we think that closer relatives are more likely to have more similar plant chemistries. But in this Ligodium situation, what we found was that that wasn't necessarily the case. So Ligodium japonicum, which as if you remember the, um, the phylogeny on the previous slide is actually fairly distant from Ligodium microphyllum. However, if we look over here, we see that the volatile distance or the volatoid central distance, which is a measure of similarity, is almost the same in both of those species. And you get the same amount of eggs deposited on that by a um, uh, the Ligodium, brown Ligodium moth, Neomucetema conspurcatalis. We can also see that it clusters very nicely here with two um, plant volatile compounds, three octanone, which is a, a, a fragrant um, uh, volatile organic, or excuse me, a fragrant plant secondary compound, uh, and also has been found to increase the rate of oviposition on uh, Ligodium microfilm. So interestingly enough though, 
that brings up a whole new set of questions. Should we actually be looking more at plant chemistry and rather than uh, phylogeny to investigate host range tests? So Wheeler at all argue that we ought to, and uh, I can see this going in two different directions. It may either expand our, our host test plant list, or it could possibly reduce it and then reduce the amount of time that these organisms need to be in quarantine being tested. If we can weed out the, the species that are very distantly chemically related to the host plant, then that may make things more efficient within that quarantine setting. The other major uh, advancement that's taken place, especially within the last 20 years, has been this prioritization framework in which we prioritize impact. Uh, before this, and especially during the early part of bi classical biological control, there was essentially a shotgun approach where we thought, let's bring everything over, everything that we can get established, everything that we can rear, we should release. More is better, more is more, right? Well, what we figured out rather quickly was that there can be antagonistic effects when you have multiple species interacting within the same guild. So we've really focused more on a couple of different questions. One being impact, so and impacting different areas. For example, the acacia program in South Africa wanted to specifically impact seed uh, seed production and flower production. So we may in, import a seed producer. If we want to impact growth and biomass, that may be an herbivore and a, and a foliage feeder. If we want to uh, further impact biomass but not interfere with the foliage feeder, we might introduce a galler. So really looking at different guilds, different feeding guilds and gauging their impact based on initial studies in the, in the uh, native range. So uh, this is where I will put a huge plug in for our foreign biological control labs. Much of the work that uh, has been successful in the Southeast and, and in the US in general has been because of the work that and collaborations that we have with our overseas biological control labs. When we do foreign surveys, we generally uh, try and pick up everything that's going to be host specific, uh, but we pick up generalists from time to time. And the reason we can tell they're generalists is because we also survey everything around it. So when we go out and survey for, let's say an early acacia agent, I look at other acacias that are around it, but I'll also look at at the gum species, the eucalyptus species that are there, the other, um, other let's say Melaleuca species that are around there. So really looking at the major community constituents and seeing if we find something that's on all of them, immediately shunting that, uh, but just saying that, you know, we'll publish something that says that an insect we collected was on there. But it's pretty clear when we find just one species on one plant that that's probably going to be host specific, at least to the genus level, and then we can move out from there. And then finally, and this is sort of a new one, uh, we're starting to look at community uh, interactions and behavior as a factor for prioritizing biological control agents. Is it commonly attacked by a multitude of parasitoids? And will we potentially see biotic resistance or indirect effects because of that? And then finally, ease of rearing. And um, in my lab, you're probably never gonna find a, a stem borer because they're impossible to rear. So. Uh, but just to sort of give you, you know, again, just a pictorial example, we've, uh, how does this look like in real life? We uh, determine feasibility, we go over to the native range to do foreign surveys. Uh, do we develop rearing protocols, and this is almost always done within those foreign labs because it can be done outside of a quarantine facility. Again, stem borers are really hard. Um, we focus on feeding guilds. And then finally, we will do some initial studies to look at physiological behavior as well as community interaction. So temperature dependent development. We frequently employ climate matching and try to pick things that are from areas that have a similar climate. but not necessarily, and so we need to put them in chambers and see how they do uh, at different temperatures. And then finally, behavioral studies. Are these things easy to rear? Do they mate readily in, 
in quarantine, in a lab situation? Are we going to have a, a, a situation where males and females come out at different times and we have, we have asynchrony when they're released? So all of that needs to be looked at before release and before really spending a huge amount in, in resources to get these from A to B. And again, just to show you some pretty pictures of insects because they're fun, uh, we have utilized uh, congeners from other successful programs. So for the early ficacia program, we've really started looking at galling wasps, which were used frequently and extensively on acacia species that are invasive in South Africa. So far, this one looks great. And then one that we are still pursuing because it has the potential to have a high impact, but it brings about questions about whether or not it's going to be effective in the new range because it's incredibly difficult to rear in captivity. We have to hand mate females to males. We basically behead a male and then hand mate him to a female in order to keep these populations going. Is that something that's going to happen when we release them into a new uh, and to a new environment, we're not sure, but it, it definitely brings up questions about whether or not that should be pursued. How has this been su successfully applied? Well, the Melaleuca program here in South Florida is a perfect example. We focused the initial uh, releases on a weevil species, which if you recall beetles, they have two uh, life stages that feed. So both the larval and adult life stages are foliage feeders and particularly new foliage feeders where plants like to put lots of resources. So this one was initially prioritized because of that. And then two additional insects were released because they are in totally different feeding guilds and would not have an antagonistic impact on, um, on that species. So let's see what that looks like in real life. Here's a picture I just went out and took probably last week. What you can see here is all three species working in conjunction to pretty much uh, make this species functionally uh, irrelevant in the community. So uh, you've got, let's see if I can point this out on the pointer. Here is larval feeding damage on the leaves. There's some adult feeding damage and whatnot. All of these tip galls are from this insect here, Lophodoplosis trifida, which is the tip pea galler. And then if you look real close, there's flocculants from this sap feeder, which is the boreal glycaspis melaleuci. So again, focusing on feeding goal, guilds and prioritizing those that are going to be as effective as possible has really made the melaleuca uh, um, project quite successful. So a 90% reduction in the last 20 years, uh, I think. And, and it's also a great example of integrated control. Increasingly, what we're being asked to do is anticipate um, climate shifts and in uh, and responses to climate change. But before we even do that, we have to make sure that our our agents are well adapted to the places where they're intended to go. So, for example, if we look at water hyacinth and a newly introduced since 2010 plant hopper, Megamelis scutellaris, the original populations were collected in Argentina, a bit more south, a bit more temperate, and those would have been well suited for places like South Africa or even the Delta in California where water hyacinth is quite problematic, but they also have a more temperate ecosystem. These guys were not doing well in Florida, and so in 2012 we went back and collected more warm adapted uh, individuals and populations. So what we increasingly need to do is to have a full picture of the ecological envelope of both the host and the potential agent. And that again goes back to an investment in chambers and chamber studies and environmental uh, shifts within either we can look at that in the native range if we have staff on the ground to do that, or we can try and do that within an artificial chamber setting in quarantine. So again, one of the things that we like to do, especially um, pre-release, but even post-release is try and anticipate where our insects will be in the future. And, uh, and increasingly, again, we, we don't live in a bubble where biological control weeds and we and their host plants are subject to all of the same changes and climate shifts as everything else is because of climate change. And so We've generally used climate matching and occurrence and um, 
and an occurrence presence absence models to produce these species distribution models and predict where both the weed might go and whether or not our biological control organisms will meet them in that new place. We've been able to incorporate far more uh, biotic interactions based on survey information to get a much clearer picture, but this increasingly needs to be done in order to make better models. Uh, we have great modelers that can do lots of um, lots of great things, but and uh, again, just to sort of uh, give you a picture of what this graphic is doing, it's saying that we can use all of these different environmental predictors, occupancy dynamics of presence absence data, abundance dynamics, how much of something is in a particular area, the species distribution models coupled to populations, uh, demographic data, and then of course ecophysiological data can all be used to predict population shifts and uh, and and uh, distribution of both uh, of of organizational levels from communities all the way down to individual. So uh, this is where the future is in terms of prediction of range and range expansion for everything, including weeds and their uh, biological control agents. So we're gonna move out of quarantine. We've gotten our, our permit from APHIS, everything looks great. Our host range tests so showed no non-target impacts. What happens when we start releasing these things into a new environment and they start interacting with everything out there? Well, many times one of the first things they interact with are predators and increasingly uh, biological control practitioners have been tasked with looking at how um, how biological control agents might have indirect effects. So one of the questions that I always get when I give a talk is not only if, if well, one is what's it going to eat besides its target plant, which we can answer pretty definitively. But the other question is, well, what is it going to do that you haven't thought about? And that's, you know, I don't know. <laughs> it's a fair question, but we are starting more and more to look at that. And one thing where we're using these molecular tools is to get an idea of the subsidy and the trophic level usage of our biological control agents. So for example, I've put an ant out here. This is an Argentine fire ant. They are frequently predators of our biological control agents, but let's also say that we have spiders, even mice can utilize biological control organisms. And so we can do gut content analysis either through fecal collections or um, we will just collect ants or spiders, smash guts, and then run it through a, a survey with various primers to see if we can find evidence of utilization of our biological control organisms. So in the case of this little brown ligodium moth, we've seen that several species of spiders will happily utilize and eat it. Several species of stink bugs will use it. Um, ants will happily use this Brazilian pepper thrips and we found it in the gut contents. But once again, beetles for the win. If a beetle has lots of uh, plant secondary compounds that and, and it eats a pretty poisonous plant like this Lilia cerus chenai that eats a, a, a wild, or excuse me, um, a, a yam species, so diascariable bifra or air potato. It has so many toxic compounds still in its body that it's pretty in it's pretty not susceptible to any level of predation. So herbicides or excuse me, insecticides will kill it, but um, but not spiders. So that's good to know. Keeping on that same track of looking for uh, DNA evidence or the DNA needle in the um, Melu haystack, we've started to try and develop uh, environmental or DNA uh, uh, methods for looking for new populations of biological control as well as uh, new populations of a potential weed in a new area. So uh, environmental DNA is when we take 
a sample from a substrate that's usually water, uh, although increasingly it can be from air and, and it can even be from soil. Uh, it can also be from those gut contents. So, but we take a sample of environmentally um, derived DNA, run it through a, an assay to look for either a primer for one species or to look for multiple species. Um, which would is a meta barcoding usage. And then we can also employ qPCR in order to look at the quantity of DNA in that system, which can be a proxy for abundance. So again, these, these tools that have been developed for uh, weed detection, invasive species detection, whether that's vertebrate, invertebrate, or plant or fungi, or can also be very useful in detecting uh, small but persistent species of biological control organisms. As I mentioned, uh, some of the biggest criticisms that have been lobbied at biological control practitioners has been that we aren't answering the hypotheticals. We go out, we look for impact, we say, yes, it's, you know, biomass is reduced, flowering is reduced, seeding is reduced, we won, right? And then we don't look at trophic interactions. Well, that's not the case anymore. We now have several examples of looking for these indirect effects and unanticipated consequences, as several papers have mentioned. So just wanted to give you a quick uh, schematic of what this looks like. So this is Oxyops videosa. We test directly for negative non-target impacts here in quarantine. That's the main purpose of what we're looking for. We test, we want to see positive impacts on the community through the um, decrease of the target weed, and that may have indirect effects on the community where we see uh, positive community recovery because of the decrease in that weed. But where this dashed arrow is are potential interactions that we weren't anticipating. So again, the, the indirect effects. And we looked directly at this in terms of an apparent competition example in the water hyacinth system. So let me just give you a, a quick rundown of this experiment that we had running for several years. So water hyacinth, world's worst weed, uh, Pontedaria crassipes, name has changed. So uh, you can you can change your t-shirts. Uh, it's a floating aquatic macrophyte from South America. And we've got three effective biological control agents on it, two weevils that were introduced in the 1970s and our good friend, Megamella scutellaris that was introduced in 2010. Uh, it, it, populations from Uruguay are established here in Florida. Uh, this is a real picture that was stitched together from Lake Okeechobee. That is a real sized human there in a uh, eight foot wide airboat, just to give you the scale of the, of the system um, and what we're working with here. Within that same ecosystem, though, are rooted emergents. So, so this is cow lily or nufar. You, this is a very common uh, North American water lily. Uh, it spreads through rhizomes and seeds, and it too has a congeneric plant hopper, Megamelis davisi, um, which feeds and reproduces in cow lily and has a native fairy wasp parasitoid. So question one, does that native wasp parasitoid also use Megamella scutellaris? Well, we ascertained that within a year of release, and the answer is absolutely yes. So then that brings about questions about whether we have apparent competition. So that's this dashed line here. Do we get a spillover? So a population subsidy for the fairy wasp from Megamella scutellaris that then spills back over onto Megamella stavisi, decreasing its populations. So that's question one. Question two, does that then have downstream producer co consequences? For example, do we get fewer Megamella scutellaris because of predation from Megamella, or excuse me, from the fairy wasp, which decreases the water hyacinth or decreases the impact on water hyacinth and and increases the competitive interaction between water hyacinth and cow lily or do we get so much predation on the native megamelis that we then see an increase in the competitive interaction for um, cow lily Anyway, there's a huge network of potential interactions uh, and I can go over that more but uh, this was a big study over several years just to get the answer of 
No. <laughs> so in short, we did see some variation in the usage of both Megamelis davisi and Megamelis scutellaris over seasons, but it was pretty consistent between the two. So we saw nearly identical utilization between those two, which is pretty interesting, but certainly no evidence of apparent competition being mediated by that fairy wasp. So answer number one, no. And when it comes to the producers, we also saw no indirect effects. So we do see, um, this one's kind of a weird one where we uh, had herbivores in there, but not parasitoids. And we got in, uh, high leaf area for cow lily, but that could just have been a compensatory response. So I'm it, I'm not ignoring it, but it wasn't mediated by the parasitoid. So we didn't see any indirect effects on this producer, on producers or on the host plant in this very tight system with two species, one shared parasitoid. But what happens when we get into real life with a far messier system? We looked at that with a very similar setup with the Ligodium brown moth which has now nine parasitoids accumulated on it. Uh, and I'll just spare you a, a lot of talk to tell you that out of 500 parasitoids that we reared from co-occurring Lepidopteran hosts, we found 38 that could potentially be overlapping. And even within that, we've recently had those um, identified at the systemic entomology laboratory and only five of over 500 uh, appear to have been shared parasitoids between something that would attack this species and something that would attack a native species. So less than 1% uh, found over a three-year span. What we're really seeing here, it, I can uh, I contend, is biotic resistance. So you have a new insect all of these various um, either specialists or generalists are utilizing it. And instead of having it be a subsidy, it's really just reducing the effectiveness of this insect, which then gets back to one of my previous slides, which is that if we had done more on the front end to look at parasitism rates and to look at uh, both parasitism and predation rates in the native range, we potentially could have been able to predict the high utilization of native parasitoids of this species. So again, a little bit more work on the front end could save us a lot of time and energy on the back end. Here's the fun part with new toys. Ecologists love new toys. And when we started seeing that consumer UAVs were coming down in price and were becoming more attainable, we thought, how can we use these? Because it's incredibly taxing work getting into these places. They're frequently accessible by specialized vehicles like airboats or, or swamp buggies. And so having a tool that gets into those places that doesn't require a hand placement of uh, of insects is, is great. So we were able to work with a couple of groups, including the US Army Corps of Engineers to develop a servo switch that's done on a remote control that takes both Ligodium, which is pictured here, but also uh, the leaf plant, excuse me, plant hoppers for water hyacinth. And they will happily be released from that and are when we've seen establishment from this method. So um, we have to buy some new DGI ones because they're no longer allowed, uh, but it's definitely a useful tool for uh, releasing and dispersing agents. But potentially even more useful is, uh, is the propagation of high uh, spatial resolution images that are taken by these uh, UAVs. So this is a this one on the left is a six um, six copter, and it can hold a fairly uh, high um, high powered image processor on a camera. So we can get good resolution pictures uh, relative to other remotely sensed images, either satellite remote sensed or other fixed wing aircraft that's taken by aerial reconnaissance. So we can take those aerial images and um, then stitch them together. And if you look in this picture here, you'll see sort of known um, uh, uh, items placed in there. So those are to re for reference points, both with length, as well as to allow the 
uh, machine learning system to confirm that that is in fact, say water hyacinth or tussock grass or tropical soda apple. And then each of those pictures can then be put into a, um, can be classified based on vector analysis. Uh, this can be done over several iterations, feature learning-based uh, computer is, or excuse me, feature-based learning is applied, and then, um, and then it shoots out the other end with a 95% accuracy um, for identifying any one of these species. This could easily be then be applied to herbivores, where we could take pictures of herbivore-laden um, or consumed weeds, uh, put that through a computer learning system and be able to identify those through these pictures taken from drones at between five and 10 meters. So it's going to be really interesting to see how these are used in the future, especially as image processors get smaller and less expensive and lighter. And also uh, fixed wing aircraft and fixed wing UAVs become better. So we might be able to capture even more area and more space at greater distances than we are now. But this is going to be a very useful tool, especially on large scale uh, invasions or even medium scale invasions when we're looking for these uh, insect populations. So that's where things look like now. Let's talk about how I think things are going to look in the future and let's say the next 30 to 50 years. Weed biological control, as I mentioned before, is subject to the rain shifts um, that are being imposed through climate change. And so a larger investment in climate chambers and climate uh, climate altering chambers, including CO2 uh, inputs are going to be really necessary as this, as the um, as we go into this next era where we might see really intense change in both atmospheric CO2 levels, but also uh, weather patterns, climate patterns and uh, stochastic events. And that's going to be quite helpful in predicting agent success. Getting back to that idea of plant chemistry and how it might impact uh, arthropods. So it's basically a chemical dance, right? Uh, plants produce uh, plant secondary compounds and, and those can either attract or repel uh, their hosts. So they might be attracting to pollinators, but detracting to herbivores. Um, and in kind, those same, uh, those same compounds might be produced when something's being eaten to draw in parasitoids. So this can all get shifted and we don't really understand how this is going to work with climate change. Of course, when plant secondary compounds are produced through herbivory or through pathogen defense, uh, it has a direct impact on biological control success. So we might see a, a increase in uh, defensive compounds for pathogens, but a decrease in defensive compounds for herbivores or vice versa or both. Any number of the combinations could impact how that, um, how that resolves. Uh, volatile organic compounds. So these are, these are not stable. They're um, produced in, in volatiles that waft out into the adjacent air that has direct implications on herbivores and how they can perceive uh, host range, or excuse me, how they perceive their host and finding the host and finding oviposition sites. Likewise, if a plant produces more VOCs uh, post herbivory, that may call in more predators and then produce, or excuse me, reduce the impact of biological control organisms. And then finally, we may see indirect impacts from atmosp changing atmospheric conditions. So as plants become more stressed through drought response or warming response, we may see an indirect impact on the herbivore. So we might see instead of higher C to N ratios because of that, um, because of atmospheric pollution or a high carbon uh, fertilization effect from atmospheric carbon, we might actually see a decrease because plants actually can't take that much up or they are so stressed through heat and drought that they are just pushing off all kinds of chemicals and, and VOCs and, uh, and it's, a, it's a poor uh, source and host now. So 
lots of black boxes to look at for the next 50 years in this particular interaction. And then finally, uh, I've got a postdoc who's working on this idea about machine learning. Can we utilize successes and failures as well as uh, environmental parameters, plug all of that data into a learning-based system and shoot out uh, traits that are going to be most successful at finding the best new biological control agent for a new host. So um, that's uh, that's about all I'll say about that because it's basically all I understand about it. Uh, but anyway, basically using the information from our uh, from our successes and failures to inform to inform the next choices we make. So just to uh, wrap it all up, um, biological control, when it's used in an integrative approach with other methods, including chemical and cultural removals, can drastically increase success and reduce costs. So recall that for biological control, all, most of the costs, the bulk of the costs are done up, are invested up front. Once it's out, it's they're self-perpetuating and free. And so that return on investment goes up uh, basically linearly as long as the organism is on the landscape. When we're looking at potentially reducing herbicide use and uh, the development of uh, herbicide resistant weeds, biological control can be quite helpful in that because it reduces the need for as frequent and frequently as high a rate of herbicide in these systems. Modern safety testing, host range testing within a quarantine facility is incredibly effective at predicting host range use, but it might be improved and, and even made more efficient through new tools like chemical analyses. And then finally, if we're going to be addressing a changing climate and shifting ranges of these large scale uh, invasive weeds, we need to make capital investments into our quarantine facilities that include uh, environmental chambers. And so with that, I will just finish up by saying once again that uh, the folks at my lab are pretty spectacular at, at doing hard ecological work, and we would not be where we are without the international collaborators in Argentina and Australia, and I would love to take questions. Oh, great. Thank you, Melissa. That was, that was awesome. Um, I really like your picture of the UAV look like it's carrying a clump of kudzu away. So maybe that's a new mechanical. That's, a, <laughs> <laughs> that's actually a UAV carrying Ligodium. Um, okay. And I see that Stephen Enlow is on the talk. I, that was uh, in Loxahatchee with one of his students that, that we did that. So yeah. Um, yeah. Very cool. I don't want to take up too much time because I know we've got a few questions and we're close to the top of the hour. So um, if you can, can you see the questions? or do you I can. Okay. Yeah, no, I can see it. So Stephen asked the um, approval of the two Phragmites control agents. I don't know what, so um, TAG approved them in 2019. Of course, TAG is just the first step. They've got to go through the um, environmental assessment and environmental impact uh, um, through fish and wildlife. And so that's usually where things get stuck. So if you are wondering, um, Stephen, you can email me and I'll tell you who to call. <laughs> um, so Angie asked, do you know of any biocontrol options for honeysuckle and buckthorn? I live on sandy soil. Uh, I am not aware of any biocontrol uh, options for honeysuckle or buckthorn. Um, I recognize that those are both problematic, especially vines. Vines are hard. Um, also, many props to you and your group for being such awesome collaborators. Ah, oh, thanks, Stephen. Kudos. Fan club from the University of Florida. Um, would an agent die of starvation rather than feed on an alternative? Yes, that is the um, basically the threshold. So um, feed, they might take like a quick bite. Uh, Ellen Lake and I used to call it a no thank you bite because that's what we had to do as children. Um, but they'll, they'll take a quick taste bite. But again, this is a very tightly co-evolved relationship between a specialized insect and its host range plant. And so it doesn't have the, and this is why plant chemistry is really important. It doesn't have the um, biochemical tools to process things that are outside of its host range. So yes, it will just die. Do you use, do you see a use for biological controls for agricultural crops? 
like weeds in agricultural crops. I'm not sure what that means. They do use classical insect biocontrol for insect pests in ag systems. Um, I just, there, we would never, we would never intentionally introduce something that attacked an agricultural crop. Like that's a hard no. I know you didn't want to go into ICA, but I was wondering if there's any data studies on invasives that exhibit this behavior during climate change uh, or that they are involving faster than natives. Most, and I, there is, there's a pretty broad literature on it, um, um, Chans, uh, but I, that's a, that's another hour long talk. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. Um, but generally speaking, invasive plants will often have, um, broader ecological envelopes than natives, but not always. Residential use. Yes, you can use them for residential use. Lots of people do here in Florida. And we're just at the top of the hour. How can the Weed Science Society of America be most helpful? Thanks, Greg Dahl. Um, well, you know, like uh, biological control is an ARS, uh, like many other places we, um, we are at the service of the American people and our stakeholders. And so if we are something that you think is important, it's important that you let folks know that we're important. Yeah, and I think that's a great uh, one to end with. And uh, But I will say for you who have questions further to please reach out to Melissa. I'm sure she'd be happy to answer your questions by email or maybe a phone call or something like that. So feel free to do that. Um, as well as myself, if there's a way that I can help uh, make that connection, uh, please do that. Uh, also, there's a reminder just to, for those of you um, who have seen this or, you know, want to share this with your colleagues, this is being recorded. So this will be posted uh, on our landing page um, probably in a couple of days. So you can watch the recording as well and watch it many times if you'd like. So um, again, thank you, Melissa, for the great talk. This has been really informative. I've, I've learned some things. And I know the people in the audience have as well. And the last thing that I will say is um, please join us next week, same time, same place. Uh, we're going to talk about automation, technology, all that kind of fancy stuff. So um, join us for that. And I'm sure you'll, you'll, you'll learn something that, there as well. So thanks again, everyone. And we'll, we'll see you later.